Welcome back, good people, to Black History Month, Episode 2. Before I begin, let's recap last week. First, I introduced the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson, and provided the reason why he began Negro History Week in 1926. We know he started Negro History, history Week because the history of black people was non-existent while a doctrine of racial superiority was being taught in public schools. So if black people were nothing more than savages, how could they have a history? What did Carter G. Woodson know that made him push against the teachings of racial superiority and inferiority in the public school system? Let me share with you what I've uncovered in my studies of black history. The French general Napoleon Bonaparte once asked, what is history but a fiction agreed upon? And if we go back to the late 18th century, we will see major events that forever changed history and humanity. First, Napoleon Bonaparte launched a military campaign into Egypt from 1798 to 1801. During that invasion, there was also a French scientific campaign into Egypt. This is when the Rosetta Stone was discovered, thus creating the field of Egyptology. A decade prior to the creation of the field of Egyptology, a Frenchman by the name of Count Constantine de Volnay wrote a history book entitled The Ruins of Empires, which described his journeys in Egypt between 1783 and 1785. His book was extremely popular, which prompted the book being translated into an English and American version. In his book, Volney states, there are a people now forgotten who discovered while others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and sciences, a race of men now ejected from society for their sable skin and frizzled hair, founded on the study of the laws of nature, those civil religious systems which still govern the universe. Volney also describes the famous Sphinx as typically Negro in all features. Now that the study he is referencing is called the Great Chain of Being. The Great Chain of Being was a science that categorized the human family based on skin color and physical characteristics. Within this study, the invention of the doctrine of racial inferiority was fabricated by Johann Blumenbach, a professor at Göttingen University in Germany. In 1795, Blumenbach produced the first scholarly work on human racial classification. It was also Göttingen University who was responsible for establishing the concept of the science of antiquity. Remember the quote from Volney about the Egyptian people and his description of the Sphinx? It was removed by British editors for the English and American version of the book. So what did black scholars have to say about the great chain of being? The great social scientist W.B. Du Bois in his publication, The World and Africa, had this to say about the great chain of being. Quote, there can be but one explanation for this vagary of 19th century science. It was due to the slave trade and Negro slavery. It was due to the fact that the rise in support of capitalism called for rationalization based upon degrading and discrediting the Negroid peoples. It is especially significant that the science of Egyptology arose and flourished at the very time that the Cotton Kingdom reached its greatest power on the foundation of American Negro slavery. Dr. John Henry Clark, another black scholar, argued that, quote, there has been a deliberate destruction of African culture and the records relating to that culture. The destruction started with the first invaders of Africa. It continued throughout the period of slavery and the colonial system. It continues today of a much higher and dangerous level. There are now attempts on the highest academic level to divide African history and culture within Africa in such a manner that the best of it can be claimed for Europeans or at the very least Asians. End quote. So who are the indigenous people of the Nile Valley or in today's terms, North Africa and the Middle East? In the United States, Hollywood portrays ancient Egyptians as European. Cleopatra was played by Elizabeth Taylor. Charlton Heston played Moses in the Ten Commandments. And Gerard Butler played the Egyptian god Osiris in Gods of Egypt. Even our Census Bureau, in its definitions of race, describes white people as having origins from the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. Our Census Bureau also maintains that the racial classifications of the great chain of being, despite advances in biology and genetics, providing evidence 
that race and the notion of racial superiority and inferiority is merely a myth and has no scientific truth or basis. So back to the question, who are the indigenous people of ancient Egypt? In 1974, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization sponsored the Cairo Symposium. At this symposium, black scholars, Dr. Sheik Antidio and Dr. Theophile Obanga presented papers that destroyed the myth of racial inferiority in the African. One paper was entitled Origins of the Ancient Egyptians. In that paper, they provided 11 categories of evidence supporting the thesis that the ancient Egyptians were indigenous black Africans. Furthermore, Dr. Obanga had a paper entitled The Peopling of Egypt and the Deciphering of the Myriadic Script. Obanga provided data which confirmed the existence of substantial linguistic relationships between the ancient Egyptian language and traditional African languages. The general consensus reached at the Cairo Symposium was that there was no evidence that the ancient Egyptians were white and that Egypt was not influenced by Mesopotamia, but by peoples from the Great Lake regions and inner equatorial Africa. In the introduction to Anthony Browder's book entitled Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, Dr. John Henry Clark in the introduction says this, quote, the civilization of Egypt and of Africa in general is the most written about and the least understood of all subjects. This is not an accident or an error of misunderstanding the available information. Except for Egypt, African people have been programmed out of the respectable commentary of history. Europeans have claimed the non-African creation of Egypt in order to downgrade the position of African people in world history. They have laid the foundation of what they call Western civilization on a structure that the European mind did not create. Egypt, a Nile Valley civilization, was already old before Europe was born. The Nile Valley civilization also existed before the Western Asian civilization of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers." End quote. So here's what we know. Black scholars, whether it be Drs. Diop, Banga, Clark Woodson, and others, have presented evidence and argue that the indigenous peoples of the Nile Valley civilization or Egypt are people of the so-called black race. If black people are the progenitors of ancient Egypt, the foundation of race and all that we've come to understand about race in our nation is a farce. Some people may discredit the perspective of black scholarship, so let's look to respected historical figures about the authenticity of the indigenous people of ancient Egypt and their contributions to civilization and world history. Herodotus, who is known as the father of history from ancient Greece, in his writings, describes the Egyptian as black-skinned and having woolly hair. Other notables from ancient Greece, such as Aristotle, Homer, and Plutarch, also describe the Egyptians as indigenous Africans in their writings. But going back to Herodotus, he also wrote this about the Egyptians. Almost all of the names of the gods came into Greece from Egypt. My inquiries prove that they were derived from a foreign source, and my opinion is that Egypt furnished the greater number. The Egyptians were the first to introduce solemn assemblies, processions, and litanies to the gods, all of which the Greeks were taught to use. It seems to me a sufficient proof of this that in Egypt these practices have been established from remote antiquity, while in Greece they are only recently known. Now let's fast forward in time. Henry Gorenz, Lieutenant Commander of the United States Navy in 1882, said this about Egypt. Egypt itself is a book of history, one of God's great monumental records. It was the birthplace of literature, the cradle of science and art, the garden and garner of the world. In the branches of the court of art and the science of architecture, they were undoubtedly far in advance of us at the present day. The architectural types of all other structures of antiquity sink into insignificance when compared with those of Egypt. The Egyptians were the first to observe the course of the planets, and their observations led them to regulate the year from the course of the sun. They were a wonderful race, combining within themselves all the branches which adorn, beautify, and add to the reputation of a people when directed in the right channel. So if the indigenous people of ancient Egypt are the so-called black race of human beings, 
then that means that black history dates back as early as 3150 BCE. And if you consider the kingdom of Cush, which I didn't get into today, was situated south of Egypt or the Upper Nile Valley. And they are also of the so-called black race and their history begins nearly 200 years before the rise of the first dynasty in Egypt. As I close, I hope that I'll offer the perspective using primary sources and perspectives of black scholars that will bring about critical thinking in regards to how we view humans of African descent and their contributions to civilization and world history. George Orwell, in his famous book, 1984, offered us something to think about in the context of black history. Consider this phrase, whoever controls the image and information of the past will determine what and how future generations will think. And whoever controls the information and images of the present will also determine how those people will view the past. I leave you with these questions. If we reframe world history to reflect the truth, and in particular, the history of black people, how might that change how future generations will think? And how might reframing the past inform how we change the information and images of the present? That's all I have for you this week in black history. And stay tuned for episode three, which will highlight African influences and contributions to Western civilization, and in particular, the United States of America. Until next time, I leave you with peace and love. Thank you.